Washington, D.C. to take back the White House? Read my lips. No new taxes. We see Russia from land here in Alaska. To a number of women's groups and said, can you help us find folks? And they brought us whole binders full of, uh, of women. Work begins anew. The hope rises again. And the dream lives on. Thank you for joining us here on The Race. You're joining us for episode three of our season. Uh, if you haven't yet had a chance, please check out episodes one and two. You can find them on iTunes, Spotify, on Buzzsprout, on Facebook, pretty much any. Buzzsprout. Buzzsprout is where we host them. Oh. Um, but again, thank you for joining us. I'm Gary Mannion. I'm one of your hosts. And I'm Jim Blasford. He had to get that in there. He, was, he wasn't a fan of me introducing him, so. Well, that's. He wanted to introduce himself. <laughs> um, probably not asking for that. Uh, thank you for joining us. So uh, if you've listened to our podcast previously, you know this is the race. We're covering this season races of individuals you didn't know you wanted to know more about. Things you didn't know well, about think, how yeah. that person It's really tough. Famous. We were going about it. It's basically famous people, famous politicians, and basically how they got their start. Yeah, the, how, race, how the races you didn't, you didn't know. know about them. Yeah. yeah. We, we go back and forth on what the actual title is. Or we keep confusing. At least I keep confusing myself. Um, so we have uh, today, we're going to, it's sort of a two part episode, really. Uh, you're going to be, the, the episode three and four is sort of a similar thing. Um, and we're going to be covering the two arguably biggest races in Congress in 1946. That no one cared about at the time. At the time, you didn't yeah. know you cared about them. They, they, so this is the incoming freshman class of 1946. Um, actually, it turns out to be a Republican majority for the first time in a, a little over a decade. Um, so this is after World War II. This is immediately following World, the finish of World War II. Um, Arguably, these individuals were campaigning before the war was before, over. Before the war, the war was, was over. over. Yeah, so... Uh, the, the the really the, the two parter this is about Richard Nixon's first race for Congress and JFK's first race for Congress. So the first episode will cover uh, Nixon, and next episode will cover JFK, uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, but the main thing is that these two become almost eternally linked when it comes to uh, American politics. You have Richard Nixon who is a freshman congressman from California, goes on to become a senator from California, and then becomes vice president, eventually runs for president, loses, and then becomes president finally in the 70s, uh, as opposed to, uh, sorry, not 70s, 68, um, as opposed to JFK, um, so young congressman from Massachusetts, goes on to be long-term uh, and I'd say very popular family in Massachusetts at the time, the Cabot Lodges, um, goes on to beat them as a Democrat in Massachusetts, which is very heavily Republican at the time, um, and then wins the presidency against previous mentioned candidate Richard Nixon. Um, so this is really, um, I think these two go hand in hand. In fact, Gary and I in college both took a course um, called Kennedy Politics by Dean Bergeron, um, very popular professor at our, our university at the time, UMass Lowell. I took the class. Jim just showed up. I took the class before Gary was even in college, and then I kind of showed up for his class too. It was a really good class. Uh, but they, they, these two men really, they start out together. They go into the Senate almost two years apart, um, and they really, they really never become friends, but they, they definitely become enemies, as it were. So so what we're going to start off this episode with uh, Richard Nixon, as we said. And so to, to really begin, the best place to start with Richard Nixon what is in the 12th District in California. So the 12th District in California uh, is sort of a suburb of L.A., and it is the, I want to say the victim of, I don't think it's victim is the word, the right word. It's sort of the uh, 
bearer of the Roosevelt era, right? Yeah. So 1936 happens, and Roosevelt pretty much brings in all these Democrats across the nation because of the market crash, because of this whole new deal that he's proposing. He's really starting to get this progressive-ish, not as what we know today as progressive, but this very um, Forward thinking. forward-thinking movement going. And so uh, a Democrat by the name of Jerry Vuries. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna Vuries. I'm gonna pronounce that wrong about ten <laughs> times today. But Jerry Vuries becomes the Democrat elected um, in that district. Rather conservative Democrat, but Democrat nonetheless. A conservative area. Very conservative area, and he actually falls victim to it several times while he's elected. The Republican state assembly, Republicans in the state assembly. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. The Republicans in Congress try to redistrict him. No, it was in the state uh, assembly. Was the state assembly? Yeah, the California state, state assembly. State assembly then. Re- try to redistrict him out of his district and try to take his Democratic strongholds out and, and give him give him con- um, conservative areas. And even through that, uh, he actually does it. He's able to get reelected several times, um, four times actually, mm-hmm. up until 1946. And arguably, Jerry Vuries does as well as he does because the Republicans just don't mount anything viable against him. Um, he has several different uh, opponents over the years, but they were never able to actually get anyone strong enough to to actually do it. In 1938, there's a story in 1938, his opponent that he, he had at the time was such a bad opponent, he was so shy that the first time Vuries and him went to a, a public forum, Vuries actually had to introduce him to people because he, he was a, such a shy, quiet guy, not somebody that runs for Congress, obviously. So there were people like that throughout. Um, in 1940, he faced a military school principal, and his 1942 opponent uh, was the former Prohibition Party gubernatorial candidate, Robert Schuller. Um, and there's a story about Robert Schuller out there. Uh, basically, he was he's this radio preacher. He's a Prohibition Party candidate, but he was running as the Republican. He embarrassed the GOP. Um, they divided so much over the, over who the candidate was over the years that Baruiz just kind of walked into it every single time. So over the election of 1946, as we'll jump into – you kind of hear that everyone was kind of shocked that Richard Nixon did as well as he did because he was running against a strong candidate. The argument is that Vujuris was never really a strong candidate. It was just that he was the right place, right time, and the Republicans were so unorganized uh, in the 1930s, early 40s, that it took them a while to kind of mount an actual campaign. And the second they actually mounted something legitimate, Richard Nixon, um, things sort of changed a little bit. I mean, that also being said, 1946 was a really good year for Republicans. Like I said, this is the first year they take back Congress in over a decade, um, which um, they end up losing two years later because of the presidential election uh, for Truman. Um, but um, they they end up gaining it back two years later. So it, it kind of – this is actually the last time – speaking of recent events, Nancy Pelosi coming back into her speakership. This is the – Last time that a sitting speaker or a former speaker comes back as speaker, this is the last time in U.S. history. So from 19 – I think it was 1950 to present, 2018, that was the last time a former speaker was no longer speaker but came back. Um, so th- this is tumultuous times in Congress. It switches back and forth. Um but also in California alone, the Republicans have a complete majority of California congressional seats. There's only 23 congressional seats in California at the time, as opposed to the 53 that are now. So the population in California is growing exponentially. Um, this area is mostly farmland at the time, um, which, as you all know, um, just outside of L.A. is no longer <laughs> that. Um, it's hugely populated. The farmland is much further uh, east in California, but nowadays it was farm country. It was conservative Republican area. And so 
another part of worries too is that uh, even though this was a very conservative Republican area, so often in politics we see parties or individuals who are opposite to their district do well, um, have a lot to do with sort of how they treat their district, it's constituent services, if you will. And so Brewery's was really good with that. Um, it says here he, he was very uh, conscientious to his constituents. So he, he was one of those guys that remembered your birthday, remembered your anniversaries. Um, you got something at the birth of your child, uh, so much so that at the beginning of the race in 1946, Richard Nixon actually has a baby. Um, he has his daughter, Trisha, and Vuries actually sends him a pamphlet I'm reading here. It's called Infant Care. It was a government publication called Infant Care, uh, and Congress received about, congressmen received about 100 of them each month, and they were able to send them out to people in their district who recently had a baby, sort of like a constituent services thing, and he actually sends one to Richard Nixon, because at the time, Richard Nixon is a constituent, um, being out from Whittier himself, so it was sort of a... It, that's just kind of the guy he was. So he, he kept in touch with the people in his district, which actually helped him be as successful, I think, as he was. It, I mean, it's not like he was blown out in this election either. It, he did well. Um, actually, Ruiz came into office beating an incumbent Democrat as well. Hmm. I mean, he, well, he he beat him in the primary. Um, arguably the, not a, not, not not a viable incumbent. Congressman, yeah. But still, an incumbent nonetheless, um, who actually comes back this election as well to run um, on the prohibition ticket, which is ironic because there were multiple reports of him showing up. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of that. Uh, anyway, so the, the main crux of this election comes down to Vuris is in Congress um, working in Washington, very far away from California. Um, and and Gary mentioned as Richard Nixon had the baby, and they actually got quite a lot of press out of it. Um, this is really what comes down to the issue for Vuries is that Nixon grabbed the attention of the media and the public very very early in this race, and just does not let go. Well, so what happens now is so Vuries is going to run obviously for re-election. So the Republicans decide they now need to find somebody to run. And so to, to sort of change things up a little bit, they basically say, instead of just kind of casting a net, getting who we get, they form what they call the Committee of 100. So what would be known as the Committee of 100. And essentially what happens is it's this committee that gets put together to basically find a candidate. So it's a search committee is basically what it is. It came out under a lot of scrutiny. Um, a lot of newspapers, a lot of editorials were written negative about it because it's sort of like the political insiders were picking the candidate and it wasn't going to be up to the people to pick who they wanted to pick. The, the actual quote would be shoving Tammany Hall tactics down our throats. So it, basically they run through this entire committee and they quickly figure out why they've been having trouble over the years because they just don't have viable candidates to run. And they're actually they, there are some people who – they, they do throw around names of, of individuals. Who, very, very credible names, in fact. Is, um, there are former politicians, business owners, um, a general. General Patton. General Patton, who actually dies before the campaign even begins. He dies in a car accident. The following month so, before, yeah. So it, it wouldn't have mattered. But um, essentially what happens is, is a few of these people, well, one of these individuals, actually, Herman Perry, who uh, worked for Bank of America. He was a branch manager at the time and was a friend, a family friend of Richard Nixon. And so he actually writes to Nixon. Nixon's out in Baltimore at the time. He's still a naval officer uh, out in Maryland. And so he writes to him and says, you know, whether or not he would be interested in it. And actually, uh, we, I have an excerpt from the letter here of exactly what was said to him. And it was actually pretty pretty simple. Just, this, is, this is out of the Kennedy and Nixon book. That we actually got in our uh, uh, so it says, Kennedy class. Dear Dick, I'm writing to you. I'm writing you this short note to ask you if you would like to be a candidate for Congress on the Republican ticket in 1946. Jerry Vuries expects to run. Registration is about 50-50. Republicans are gaining. Please airmail me your reply if you are interested. P.S. Are you a registered voter in California? So clearly they <laughs> hadn't done a lot of research on him yet. Um, he this did, was just he sort did of grow up in the district. Yeah, he was from the district. That was where his family was from. It's where he lived up until, you know, being in the Navy. So 
Nixon doesn't airmail him back. Nixon actually calls him as soon as he gets the letter and is very eagerly wants to sit down and talk more about this. So they, they, they sit down. He comes back to California to sit with this committee of 100, um, and he gets a large chunk of the vote, enough so that they end up picking him as the unanimous candidate. So, and they, they give him basically the blessing. Pr- prior to this, however, Nixon is not even on the radar of these people. You have pretty prominent names. We mentioned uh, General Patton, but also Walter Dexter is the incumbent uh, state commissioner on education. So this is a statewide office. Um, you have a, a young rising star uh, Republican former football player, Stanley Barnes. Um, Nixon wasn't even in the top five choices at this time, but he comes into this committee meeting and just floors them. They, he, he gives a rousing speech. They absolutely love it. Um, and Nixon wins them over. Not as as we know him, Nixon isn't exactly the most charismatic of all candidates that we've ever had for president. But at the time, he's a young naval officer, um, and he he just blows this committee away. So this committee picks Nixon, and the the chairman of this committee. Uh, uh, Roy Day, mm-hmm. Roy Day or Roger, Roy, Roy, Roy Day, um, does what anybody would do, what I would do, is appoints himself campaign man. <laughs> so Richard Nixon obviously kind of upset about this. Doesn't even know this. Doesn't guy. Doesn't know this guy. This guy just kind of was chairman of a committee that picked him, and so now he's in charge. Nixon tries to overthrow it and, and tries to remove him several times, and that doesn't go too well um, during the primary. Um, so I actually have in front of me, I have a piece of literature or a copy of a piece of literature from, from Nixon's primary run, um, right after he was picked, basically outlining him as sort of why his stance is essentially to what he should do. Um, so the literature is highlighted. It says, produce the goods, opportunity, not regimentation, streamline the government, representation for all, a sound progressive program. Uh, and it goes on. You can actually find this online if you Google. Um, it, in the front, the front of it's just a picture of Richard Nixon. It says, "Richard Nixon is the man you want for congressman." Little did they know. <laughs> uh, a couple little excerpts of it. It's just things that I found co- completely. In, we'll say interesting for now, but um, one of the small excerpts from it is: "Tomorrow's problems cannot be solved." With the governmental procedures and practices of yesterday, we must adopt a sound progressive program in which government will work with and through private enterprise towards our goal of assuring housing, clothing, food, education, and opportunity for every American. Sounds pretty progressive to me, but that's just, <laughs> that's just me. That's just a little bit of... This is of also a very different Republican Party at the time. This is a Republican Party recovering after being completely devastated for years uh, in the polls, especially uh, after the Great Depression and so on. So it's very interesting to see see some of the platforms that the early Republicans that were coming back into power uh, ran on. Um, this race comes down to really the way that these candidates ran their races. Nixon was actively working to get elected. Breweries is in Washington doing his job as a congressman, which he felt was more important. And and that he uh, he, he pretty much said, this, I'm doing the job. People are going to appreciate that I'm doing the job, not campaigning, essentially. So the primary election happens, and that happens in on June 4th. Of 1946, and how that works is uh, it's a cross-party pla- cross-party election where basically you can register as a Democrat and a Republican, so that the Republican candidate will show up on the Democratic ticket, the Democrat will show up on the Republican oh, party like ticket. Fusion voting. Yeah, it's sort of a chance to do it, and Brewery's wins with about 60 percent of the vote. So. Mm, seven. 60 percent of the vote in the Democratic primary. Seven. Brewery's total percentage of the vote was 60%. Oh, overall, yes, between both tickets. Yes, Brewery's I apologize. Brewery's was 60% in the 1940, uh, 19, yeah, 
Yeah. Regardless, yeah. he was winning. Um, <laughs> he did win. Yes. He won. So he sort of has that mentality now that he's he he wasn't even in D- California at the time. This is, Ruiz is still in DC. He hasn't left. He doesn't actually come back until late August. Uh, originally was planning to come back early August, but had to, uh, I believe, get hemorrhoid surgery yeah. in Utah. In Utah. Um, so he didn't even make it back to California until August. And they were not, again, they were not worried about Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, the Republican Party was in in California had pretty much deemed Richard Nixon had no shot. Mm-hmm. Um, they said that they he was running up against a popular candidate. Uh, he was unknown out, outsider. And he was facing somebody that was popular. So the Democrats, definitely, Charles uh, Charles Ruiz, who was Jerry's father, wrote to him that uh, the Republicans had endorsed a Quaker named Richard Nixon and hoped that his son would still rem- <laughs> still retain a large part of the Quaker vote. Uh, but he was confident that his son would triumph again, saying, this is just another campaign that we have to go through and we have nothing to worry about. So that was the mentality of it. And, and definitely... Richard Nixon was on the ground. Ruiz wasn't worried about it. And you see this time and time again where incumbents are just comfortable because they're running against a no-name, mm-hmm. and that no-name just kind of pops up because they're working their, their tails off. Yeah. I mean, the, the major thing, I mean, that, I think that quote very much embodies the way Ruiz was running the campaign. I mean, his father was very influential on this candidate. Um, I mean, you, you can't go get a better like letter from your father saying, don't worry about it, you're fine, we got you. Uh, it, it, but in fact, um, I think there was a letter from a constituent um, mm. that they actually write, end up writing to Ruiz, explaining to him that um, uh, you, you, need to, you need to get in, you need to get here quick, essentially. That, that, that Nixon... Nixon's gonna destroy you if you don't if you don't actually start working. And the toughest part too uh, was that the Nixon so Nixon was a military guy so he he hadn't really held a job yet either uh, outside of his military which wasn't really a problem in 1946 because most guys his age hadn't held jobs because they were all off at war yeah um, and they had been at war since you know they were probably 17 years old so they they were military guys so that was their job so he had no income um, so <laughs> he had about ten thousand dollars to his name. Which he um, won through uh, card games while he was in the Navy. So he, he definitely was okay with spending that, he said. But they definitely had to get creative. So one of my favorite stories of this entire um, entire election is what happens is that they need to come up with some pamphlets early on to get his name out there. So first thing that Nixon does is they hire uh, – Pretty early on, Day helps him hire a political uh, consultant, a uh, Beverly Hills consultant named Murray Chotner. Chotner? Chotner. 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 Um, who, who goes on to continue working for Nixon up until he dies he yeah. while, while yeah. Nixon is still president. So essentially, Chotner pretty much just tells Nixon to stand there, put your uniform on, you'll be fine, you're going to do this. Um, they had a little no money. So his wife, Nixon's wife, Pat, uh, finances an entire set of campaign materials, mm-hmm. right? And it cost her about three thousand dollars, and they were able to do Which it back then. Is was a, a lot of money, significant amount of money. They're able to do it with selling some land that she had. She had a small. She her family had a small set of land. She was able to sell it, sell it, liquidate that, and get in about three thousand dollars. So okay. they take that three thousand dollars. And they buy a ton of campaign um, flyers with it. And within two weeks of it happening, of two weeks of them doing that, there's actually a break-in at party headquarters. And all $3,000 worth of pamphlets are stolen. It, Pat Nixon will later say, for a more notable break-in, that she was upset that people were so crazed about that one because nobody cared when it happened to us. <laughs> so, that was my favorite story. Is, is someone breaks into Nixon's campaign office and steals about three thousand dollars worth of material. More like today's dollars, thirty thousand dollars. They, they st- a significant amount of campaign material. Everything they had financed up until that point, and basically, they just say, 
oops, and it moves on. Fast forward, Watergate <laughs> happens, and Pat Nixon's like, wait a minute, why is everyone so upset that they're breaking into the campaign headquarters? Nobody cares what happened to us. That was one of my favorite stories. <clears throat> Granted, they rebound from that pretty quickly, but that was one of my favorite uh, little tidbits of knowledge from that election. I mean, I, I think that it, 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 it's really funny just to see the, the, the person that Nixon becomes um, – He's a paranoid individual. I guess that's probably where it started. Maybe, yeah. Maybe that's where it started. Maybe we hit something. Um, but I, I think uh, from there, uh, the the tactics, uh, especially by the Nixon campaign, become a little uh, a little dirtier, actually. Yeah. Um, so the the major uh, union at the time. Uh, was the the CIO, uh, which later fuses and becomes uh, AFL CIO as many of you know. But um, back then it was called uh, the the a short name for it was the PAC. Um, essentially, there were two types of PACs. Um, there was the NC PAC, um, which uh, later uh, Nixon produces a flyer with an endorsement for Voorhees on it. Um, this is uh, the CIO at the time was very much run at the local level by communist either sympathizers or members of the Communist Party in America at the time. Although the CIO had endorsed every single Democrat mm-hmm. in the state of California, yep. except for Jerry Voorhees. Yeah, they specifically did not endorse Jerry Voorhees because he was more of a conservative leaning Democrat. Uh, that was sort of he, he was very much anti Russia at this point in time, mm-hmm. which was a popular stance nationwide, not so much in the state of California with yeah. the labor unions. I mean, the CIO at the national level obviously denounced um, the Communist Party in America and in Russia and communism in general, but very much at the local level, the, the CIO, I mean, you had communist sympathizers. Uh, and understandably, they're in labor unions. So that's it's, how it goes. Voorhees himself later said that he believed he didn't get the endorsement uh, because he condemned Soviet Union's grab of Eastern Europe, of which the CIO was more sympathetic to, I guess. Yeah. So the, it was As the, you said. the uh, Congress of International or- Organizations Political Action Committee was what it used to be called. So CIO PAC. Um, this is different um, from the uh, National Citizens Political Action Committee. Uh, It was affiliated with the CIO, but it wasn't, they weren't the same organization. But as uh, Nixon's astute uh, uh, political advisor would point out, uh, when you have the same members of each board on both, uh, both committees, they're essentially the same thing. Uh, but they they use this endorsement by the NC PAC uh, of Voorhees to really push what we call, uh, or what is now known to be called the Red Scare. This is a tactic that Nixon uses throughout the rest of his political career, uh, just just using uh, anti-communist um, ideals essentially in America to push against his opponents. He uses it for every congressional race, every Senate race, his gubernatorial race, his presidential races. This is just all the time the Red Scare. This is this is this is how Nixon makes his career. In fact, how he gets selected as VP under Eisenhower. And so the primaries happen in this as we know the Red Scare it definitely does propel him for sure. But as as the election happens now the primary happens, they both win, Boris and Nixon move on. Um, and they have their first showdown pretty much set. It's going to be um, in South or Pasadena Junior High School. Mm-hmm. And there was supposed to be one prior to that, but this South Pasadena one jumps up out of nowhere. And so they were supposed to do it because there was a local race in South Pasadena that they wanted to get the two opponents to talk to. And to get people there, they included their congressional candidates and their, their U.S. Senate candidates at that point in time. And also the, the the assembly, the state assembly. That was what they wanted, Senate. the local yeah, yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 the local one is what they wanted. 
So the local one, um, one of the opponents doesn't show up. He refuses to show up. And the U.S. Senate candidates also don't show up. They send surrogates. They, uh, they all send a surrogate instead. So basically, Which, by, the, by the way, the surrogate for the U.S. Senate race just happened to be Richard Nixon's political advisor. So <laughs> what happens is Nixon and Buries become sort of the, the main event of this. So Buries gets up to talk. Nixon isn't there yet. Nixon shows up late. Nixon shows up late, is behind the stage while Voorhees is still talking. Voorhees gives his talk, steps aside. Nixon gets up there, Nixon gives his talk, they step aside, and they begin sort of a question and answer period. Mm -hmm. And so one of Nixon's um, supporters asks Voorhees a question and asks, basically, why are you receiving this endorsement from this PAC? In a nutshell. Why, why are you a communist? Yeah, why are you, why are you supporting communism and... and Buri's obviously vehemently uh, denies it. Now, because of Chotner, um, Murray Chotner, Nixon's advisor, had done enough political opposition research, they knew about the NC PAC, that national uh, PAC, or the, the state PAC, the local PAC, called the NC PAC, that endorsed him that was affiliated with the CIO. So, Moral of the story at this point is... Hold on. So what, one, of, one of the... How this actually ends up coming out is Buri's denies, and then... Um, a uh, supporter of Ruiz asks Nixon why he's making these false charges against Ruiz and, and why he's saying Ruiz is supported by the CIO PAC. Um, in response, this is, this, is, this, is, this is my favorite part of a campaign, um, when a piece of literature or something that, that the, the campaigns produce end up becoming part of the debate, as it were. I mean, we've had, uh, we've had, we've seen races where a candidate literally would walk up and say, have you seen this awful piece of lie that the, the, my, my opponent is producing that, that's tarnishing my record and so on? And then that's it. everyone says, no, I haven't seen that. What is it? And they read it, and it turns out not to be tarnishing their record, but in fact stating something that can be true. However, this is not the case. So what happens is during this debate now um, – they ask him whether or not he's you know, telling us lies, and Nixon says this isn't lies, and he pulls out a pamphlet from the Los Angeles Southern California portion NC of the NC PAC. Uh, and basically, he, he has it up over his head, he's walking towards him, and he basically says that this isn't, this isn't fake, I have right here. And he hands that it this, to Ruiz. That's good, that this does it. So he gives it to Ruiz. Ruiz immediately realizes there's there's an issue here he, there's an, there's an error in some way shape or form um dismisses the document and and says that he he had no idea about it which arguably he probably did have he, no idea he, about he it he was completely unaware from every uh indication how those of his aides that did know uh had quote completely forgotten to tell him so it, it was clear at that moment to richard nixon too that the crowd all sort of just changed in that moment everyone sort of under like they 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 bought into the bait that nixon had been spewing over the last few months feeding, yeah. feeding them for a while um actually there was a fellow congressman in the crowd who came that day oh. to support jerry for a reason and no, so no, he did, it wasn't a support he was the prohibition candidate. no i'm talking about something oh okay. um so there was another congressman there in the crowd that day and so jerry actually talks to him and says how did i do how did it go and, and the congressman said, he's basically, he, his exact words, he cut you to pieces. Oh, well, well, yeah. He cut you, he cut you up to pieces. So uh, it, it was, it was, it was clear in that moment that, that nothing happened. There is also another story too. <laughs> another congressman. Another congressman, <coughs> uh, former, former congressman. congressman that we had mentioned earlier was there. Uh, he was the Prohibition Party candidate, although it was noted several times that he showed up drunk. Too many too, events. Too many events. This event in particular charges the stage. Um, his name is Hopel. And former Congressman John Hopel, who Rory's beats back in 36. And so Hopel charges the stage while this is all going on. Hopel, Hopel sorry. <laughs> Hopel charges the stage while this is all going on and says, hey, basically he's upset for not being included in, in, in the debate. So he, he basically says, he basically charges that at them for that. Now, demanding to be part of the debate. The debate's pretty much over at this yeah. point. But uh, all you really need to know about Hopel is there, there's a, a small little snip, sn snippet about him um, on what he was running on. Hopeful. Hopeful. That's what I said. What uh, he was running on. Hopeful. No, no, Hopeful. What he was running on in this 
this campaign. Um, to get to get his little 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 tidbit in there, I guess. Uh, his most prominent promise was to keep people out of the district and uh, certain certain people. They were Jewish people and members of the African American community. He didn't use that. He didn't word. use those words. No, nope. you can you can very quickly Google it and figure out exactly what Hopel said. Um, you could probably already imagine it in your head. But they were it was specific to two types of people: Jews and black. Jews and and that, and, yeah. and people of the African American community. Yep. Um, and which a word in 1946 it was probably slightly more. I wouldn't say it was acceptable. It was never acceptable, but it was less shocking to a lot hear. More, a lot more common. A lot more said. common in probably in 1946 in in South Pasadena. Uh, so, under, not understandable at all that he, or I guess understandable completely as to why he had little to no success yeah. in that race. Yeah. Um, so, he uh, ends up, I, I believe, taking like 2% of the vote or something like that. But he did, however, approach Nixon very early on um, and pretty much said to him, listen, I'll drop out and endorse you because he hated breweries with a passion. Um, and uh, I'll drop out and endorse you uh, if you if you pay me um, a substantial amount of money. I, I believe it was in the thousands. And also you had to give me, uh, like promise me a position, like a civil service job um, when you become congressman. Um, Nixon considers this, um, <clears throat> but is, is talked out of it by, by his advisors at the time. Um, so, but however, it doesn't actually matter because uh, Hopel ends up uh, being a non-factor in this race. Uh, and so <coughs> Nixon sees blood now at this point. No pun intended. Yeah. But Nixon basically, as you know, it's like sort of a in a boxing match when you see blood, you can punch even harder and you punch even faster. Burris is hurt now at this point, and so Nixon goes for it. Um, he actually runs advertisements. Um, in the newspaper, in newspapers in California, basically outlining what Vuri's votes were. Uh, 132 bills introduced over the last four years, and only one of them has become law. Uh, he does a whole thing basically called, uh, the headline of, of the article was, or the headline of the advertisement was, How Jerry and Vito Voted. Vito being Vito Marcantonio. Marcantonio? Yeah, Mar Marcantonio, who was, basically, who was a communist from New York. A, li um, a, a very, very liberal congressman at the time from New York. He was a communist. Yeah. <laughs> um, we can call him what he was. He was a communist, and he was not shy about it. Yep. And so it just so happened Jerry Ruiz voted very frequently with him. Most Democrats did. Um, the so time. they basically, the, the advertisement was, vote against New Deal communism, vote Republican, vote American. And that was sort of what picked him up and sort of carried him on for the next few days. And actually, we have, uh, it, it got very... I don't want to say nasty, but it, it did get to a degree that Jerry Verhuries wasn't expecting at all. Yeah. I actually have an well, excerpt here we're going to play now uh, of Jerry Verhuries recounting how bad it actually got for him towards the end of that uh, race and how much Nixon actually, well, we won't say it was up for blood, but how much when, when Nixon realized that he had been making headway, how much attack he actually put into it. For before, just before the election, uh, a good many people came and told me, do you know about the telephone calls that are being made? And uh, I, I said, no, I didn't. Well, they said, uh, I was called on the phone by an unidentified person who simply said, uh, do you know that Jerry Boyce is a communist and uh, you should vote for Mr. Nixon because uh, of this fact? And uh, my friend said, I asked who was calling and they immediately hung up. He charged that I was the fair-haired boy and the picked candidate of the CIO Political Action Committee and that they were communist-controlled and therefore that I must be subversive in some way or another. Mr. Chotner was directing the campaign. I believe this material was written by people working in conjunction at least with Mr. Chotner and sent out to the papers. Now here, for instance, there are two. They have the same head and they have the same text. These are from two of the principal papers in the larger cities. And it says, Jerry Boyd, he's a former socialist, warmly supported by the CIO. <clears throat> when the opposition has access to all the public press and all you can do is try to send out pamphlets like this and get 
somebody to distribute them house to house, you're up against a pretty difficult situation. I mean, uh, the people who had been my friends, you know, were suddenly on the other side and telling me that uh, I'd been there long enough and it was time to get rid of me and so on and so forth. That all the stops were pulled and, uh, and Mr. Nixon beat me. He was a good debater. He was a clever debater. Uh, I wouldn't uh, deny that at all. Uh, but uh, uh, I still feel that the, there were a good many Good money below the belt blows struck in the campaign. So clearly, Ruiz was not expecting it to them. It definitely caught him off guard with how negative it went after that moment. Well, ju just to give you an example, a uh, quote from Congressman um, Bullock, who was in the crowd again um, supporting Ruiz, um, to quote, the magnitude of Nixon's triumph did not immediately dawn on us. Um, the reason is because they ended up having, I believe, four additional debates after this, um, which Nixon uh, was a champion debater. Um, he, I mean, he he went on to, to wipe the floor with him, as it were. And even though Verris was advised at the time to not debate him, essentially it gave Nixon a uh, platform that he wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and and Burris uh, later admits that it was probably the, the worst mistake he made in that campaign was debating Nixon and uh, giving him that platform, which he would never have had otherwise. And so pretty much the, the nail in the coffin now at this point is there's one last sort of ditch effort that they do. Uh, what, the, what the Nixon campaign does, and this probably could be attributed to Cloutier, who was his advisor at that mm -hmm. time, um, and as you you just heard Ruiz talk about this specifically um, in his excerpt, is that basically we we knew we knew we know the other side of it now because we know the research of it more than Ruiz knew at the time. The Nixon cam campaign hired what we now know as phone bankers, yep. nine dollars a day mm -hmm. for nine bucks a day. It sat there, a lot of money back then. and they made phone calls <clears throat> to every registered voter in the district saying, pretty much, hi, I'm a friend of yours, but I can't tell you what my name is, was their exact script. Hi, I'm a friend of yours. I can't tell you my, what your name, but can't tell you what my name is, but I wanted to call you and let you know that Jerry Ruiz is a communist. And they would hang up the phone. <laughs> and this confused so many people. Yep. And Jerry Vahuri, as you, as you just heard in the excerpt, he himself was just dumbfounded with, with what's happened. This happened very last minute. It was sort of a last dis ditch effort. And although Richard Nixon would never take responsibility for it, it's widely accepted that he, he and his campaign were responsible for it. I, I mean, one of, one of the actual ads that Nixon ran in the newspaper included uh, a suggestion that Radio Moscow had urged the, uh, the election of the CIO slate, essentially saying that <clears throat> anyone at the time endorsed by the CIO was absolutely in the pocket of, of Moscow, which at the time um, was a real fear because this is now one, like, th this, this is, the leading communist nation. It's the only communist nation actually in the world at the time. Um, and so it, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it really, I, I think embodied the red scare that especially pushed on at the last minute by the Nixon campaign really, really got people out uh, to, to vote essentially. Uh, on election day too, Nixon was out there campaigning, which is something you don't see much back in the 40s and 50s, it's more common now. Uh, but he was handing out, uh, at the polls, handing out thimbles, which obviously you don't see now, but you saw then. And the thimbles, very, very popular. The, 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 thimble, thim the thimble actually said, elect Nixon and needle the pack. <laughs> Making it, you know, the, the, the play on needle and thimbles, but the pack, the PAC was in big letters, mm -hmm. uh, being sort of rehitting that issue one more time before people went to the polls. Uh, and it, it clearly, clearly worked for him. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that um, that really never saw coming 
because there were no polls in this race. This is this is the nineteen nineteen forty six. The the sophistication of, of modern campaigning that we now know with polling and data and all this wasn't there. It 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 just I mean computers didn't even exist back then. This was absolutely uh, came out of nowhere for breweries. He, he they didn't see it coming and and they didn't see the tactics that Nixon was doing because they were doing them all uh, outside of their campaign. Obviously, they weren't telling them what they were doing. They wouldn't definitely didn't tell them about the phone calls they were making. And these were late night phone calls too. That's the best part about these phone calls. These were uh, not like daytime phone calls. These are like dinner evening phone calls. Hey, by the way, I'm your neighbor. Can't tell you who I am, but Maurice, he's communist. Watch out. Hang up the phone. I mean, this is jarring for for people. I would say. So election day happens. Uh, people show up to the polls, and, and Nixon actually walks away with 56% of the vote, uh, 65,000 votes. Um, it's not even close. Uh, he, yeah. he wins by about 15,000 votes um, and sort of begins this trutch onto uh, becoming president <coughs> of the United States. And uh, did it, a lot would say they give him credit for being a no-name person who ran against a high-profile like candidate. Again, we could argue that the candidate he was running against was very easy. To, you know, it was very easy. But he just took some organization, and at that point in time, it was just the right time. It was the right time for Republicans to run, the right time to beat a Democrat, right time for a young, energetic candidate. It was post-war. He was a veteran. Uh, he had a lot going for him. He was a smart guy. Um, so I think a lot of that played into it as well. And uh, the communism thing definitely worked as well, but that played a part. I, I think... Um... <clears throat> the, the 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 really interesting part about this race is um, how how different races in America were back then. Uh, there were they they each con each now former congressman two former congressmen and a congressman Nixon <clears throat> corresponded with each other afterwards. Um, the congressman former congressman Hopel. Um, gathering less than, uh, just over 1% of the vote at the time, ended up writing to Nixon stating uh, he had never expected to win and that his purpose had been to expose what I considered to be the alien-minded, un-American pack, red, congressional record of the Democratic incumbent. Um, so it, Hopel really... Uh, bought into this uh, idea of what Nixon was selling, which is really ironic. And we also might be giving Hope a little bit too much credit. Yeah. He was also <laughs> drunk for most of the campaign, from all accounts, and uh, was quite upset about you know, not receiving the nomination to begin with, and sort of may have just been groveling after the fact. Yeah. Because he realized he wanted to hitch his train to, or hitch his horse to the right yeah. train. Um, and despite any hard feelings, apparently, uh, Boris did end up writing to Nixon. <clears throat> um, congratulating him in early December of that year. And uh, Nixon Burris actually met um, in Burris' office and, according to Burris, parted as friends, hmm. um, which uh, they never spoke again <laughs> past that point. Uh, however, uh, it, it was... It, it, Burris uh, really goes into his this this campaign he right he ends up writing a book multiple books about this race and about nixon um that i think you, you don't see from <laughs> congressmen who get beat as it were um oh the 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 title of the book 1972 <clears throat> this is <clears throat> Just the year Nixon gets reelected president uh, wipes the floor with um, George McGovern at the time. Uh, but Burry's authors a book called The Strange Case of Richard uh, Mill Millhouse. Is that his middle? Yeah. Uh, Richard Millhouse Nixon, um, to which he states that Nixon was, quote, a quite ruthless opponent who uh, one cardinal. An unbreakable rule of conduct was to win whatever it takes 
to do it. And I think part of that too, well, part of the what, what you're, you'll hear, the difference in, in races too, is that Richard Nixon and JFK ran two different types of elections, very two, two very different campaigns. Nixon was very grassroots that they needed that. <clears throat> they needed to be able to garner the support. Didn't have any money. Kennedy was opposite. Kennedy didn't have to worry about grassroots. They were just had all the money in the world and were going to buy the election. Not so, to mention the political machine not, that was in Boston at the time. Not to say that Kennedy didn't work his tail off. I think that it's evident that he did. Um, he had to in the end. And does in later races. But Nixon had to do it with no money. And Kennedy was able to do it with some money. Arguably... JFK needed the money to win. Richard Nixon didn't need the money to win. JFK, you know, Richard Nixon was from the district. JFK was not from the district that he ran in, um, as we so often see with congressional candidates, but um, carpetbaggers, as we call them. Um, but as they're called. As they're called. I call them carpetbaggers. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I call them very, very often. Yeah. I hate a carpetbagger. But I think that that's, that's one of the, the second part of this you'll hear uh, on next week's episode is that. Um, JFK definitely they they take a different swing at this no very, pun intended very different, yeah um, so there was a summarization of the 1946 campaign I think that really uh, embodies this whole thing um, from Whitmer uh, the and the 12th district Nixon's first campaign produced the first Nixon haters and the first group of Nixon supporters this was a consequence of his campaigning style and is uh, essentially being able to polarize his constituents over basic issues. Number of uh, both groups would grow in years ahead, uh, but virtually everyone in the nation belonged to either one or the other. So that's that's that. That's 1946 in California. Um, 12th, congressional 12th Congressional District in California. Um, tune in next week. We're going to be talking again about JFK's actions in 1946. Um, to continue on this season of the politicians you know, but the stories you don't know about them, basically how they became. Comment though, like the Facebook page. Yeah, like the, the race, Facebook page. The race. Comment on there as well if you'd like. Uh, we do appreciate you guys for listening. Um, we we came up with this idea and uh, we've enjoyed it so far. We hope yeah. you have too. Um, so again, Kennedy will be next week, but we still have what's this? That'll be four. So we have we still have about six other episodes planned for the mm-hmm. season that we're, we're we've already sort of mapped out. We're looking forward to doing those. And um, if you have any suggestions. On the, where you want us to go next, we're we're looking forward to that. We're exploring a couple different options too. Uh, we're going into what will be a very interesting political presidential year. Mm-hmm. Um, We've already had one for announcement us. for the Democratic yeah. Party so far. So it, we could go a lot of different directions with this. We're excited about it. So um, thank you for subscribing again. iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, um, Buzzsprout is is the website that we we host off of. You can watch. You can get them all on Facebook. Um, and we're currently also actually, Jim doesn't know this, but we're actually trying to get on Pandora as well. Ooh. So we're, we're trying to spread out as much as we can. So if you liked it, tell your friends. Yeah, please. If you know anyone else that would be interested in this. Share the Facebook page. Uh, yeah. yeah. Help us get along. Because regardless of who is actually listening to this, we're enjoying it. So. Yeah, we enjoy so it. So we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Unlike other things where you kind of have to have an audience, we're, this is fun and informative for us. So, so thank you guys for listening. And uh, we will see you next week on the race. Well, we won't see you. We'll hear. You'll hear. Why do you we we why can't do you, see why them. Why do you have to ruin it like we that? We can't see them. That was a good ending. <laughs> Thank you.